of that copy of Power and Market? Like, do you know how it came from Marie Rothbard to a, a used bookstore or through some person? Do you? Uh, well, it, it was at IHS, and we had IHS had a small number of them. Um, the, the woman who used to be the librarian there, um, you know, she had two or three of them. And when I left IHS, uh, she gave it to me as a going away gift. And, and Murray used to hang around the, I, I call him Murray as if I knew him. Um, <laughs> Murray Rothbard used to hang around the IHS library quite a bit. And, um, you know, he probably signed some books for them or something at some point. But uh, very cool, very cool stuff. Yeah, that's great to have. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Liberty.me Live. Uh, I'm your appearing and reappearing host, Mike Reed. And tonight we're here with Isaac Morehouse to talk about his new collection of essays, Better Off Free. Uh, Isaac, as many of you already know, is an entrepreneur and a relentless communicator dedicated to the pursuit of freedom. Uh, if you uh, find any libertarian website, you are likely to find at least one Isaac Morehouse article. And he's brought uh, more than 50 of them together into this collection, Better Off Free. Uh, besides doing the writing, Isaac is also the founder and CEO of Practice. A Praxis, which is um, an innovative private sector education alternative that provides a 10-month uh, program combining real-world business experience with the best of online education for people who want more than college. Uh, Isaac's new collection, as I said, more than 50 essays in Better Off Free. It's wide ranging. It covers a lot of topics, mostly economics. There's also ethics in there. There's a lot of uh, exploration, uh, nearly poetic writing about the beauty of the market. But there's a central theme that runs the whole thing, and that's, as Isaac puts it, the theme is freedom is better than force. Uh, I think my favorite part of the whole collection is the piece on squirrels. It has this really funny <laughs> short piece on how uh, Isaac remembers writing, and I'm sure that uh, a squirrel has no intention of propagating uh, oak trees. It's just pursuing its own crazy interest, and indeed, it like loses half of the nuts it tries to collect. But nonetheless, in pursuing its own self-interest and making its own mistakes, it, it preserves and propagates the ecosystem around it. And then, of course, that he makes that into a wonderful metaphor for participants in the market, real, flawed, self-interested people who are nonetheless uh, creating this broader market system. So I, I, I think it's my favorite part of the whole piece, Isaac. So uh, Isaac Morehouse, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for joining us tonight on Liberty.me Live. I hope you're going to tell us more about your book and about the intellectual journey that you chronicle through the essays inside it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for, for having me. Thanks for the intro. <clears throat> and uh, definitely a huge thanks to Liberty.me for, for publishing the book. Uh, BK helping with editing and, and really Jeff Tucker coming to me and saying, hey, we should, we should put together a book with some of your stuff. It's funny you should mention... Um, the squirrels uh, essay in there because for, for two reasons one that is kind of the um, that essay kind of marks the point in time where the real transition had occurred it was like the point of no return so it's one thing to arrive at particular conclusions on an intellectual level but it's another thing for those to actually become habitual to, to for, for the way that you see the world to be transformed you know, I'm sure all of us have been at an event or uh, read an article or something where somebody argues a case for something, maybe something controversial, and you buy their argument. You've never heard it before. It's new. It's radical. But you say, wow, they won me over. All of their premises uh, seemed true and their conclusion followed. And that's a solid argument. And then you went on your merry way. And the first time somebody challenged you, you didn't really know it on a gut level enough to say, oh yeah, well, here's the response. It was like, well, I know this is true because I heard somebody argue it once. Like, you just need to go listen to them because I don't know it, right? I, I think it takes a long time from the point we kind of intellectually arrive at something until it really becomes who we are and the way we see the world. And the day that I was <laughs> going for a walk and watching all these crazy looking squirrels running around, and the first thing I thought of was, how this was this sort of bizarre spontaneous order and how odd it is that people have a hard time noting uh, and believing in the power of spontaneous order in the market when it's all around us in nature. Um, it's like I couldn't help but see it everywhere I looked. And, and I think once you get to that point, it's, it's, the, point, <laughs> it's the point of, of no return. Um, and it also is interesting you brought that piece up for another reason, because one of the things that I'm going to mention briefly here is um, 
just kind of on a personal level, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I'm not a, you know, academic, I'm not a, um, you know, prolific, uh, author of books or anything like that. Um, so there's always an element of embarrassment or, um, risk in saying, okay, I'm going to put a book out there, right? Even though a lot of this, everything in there, uh, has, has been accessible in one way or the other, or almost everything in there as an article or a blog post. And that can be a little scary to do those things, but something about compiling into a book, you feel like, you feel like maybe it's going to seem arrogant. Oh, this is my book of my wonderful thoughts. And, and it's just a little bit kind of embarrassing and a piece on squirrels, especially it seems so silly and trivial. And I literally, I, I went back and forth so many times on whether I should put this stupid thing in there. And I'm like, what the heck? I got to stop being so embarrassed. I'll just throw it out there. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so as, as Mike said, I mean, this book is, it's a collection of essays. And so it's got a lot of different ideas all over the place. It really, what, what it is, is my own intellectual journey over really the last like 10 years. Um, and it starts with kind of, um, in an in introduction, I explained this, that the book is actually sort of a reverse chronological order. Um, you know, the essays are all essentially standalone, but if you were to start at the very end, that's kind of where I started once I was, you know, excited about the ideas of freedom. Um, and so it's kind of just one off, hey, here's why economic regulation is a bad idea, uh, et cetera. And as I continued through, through my intellectual journey, um, I got more and more radical. Uh, and that did, that did a lot of things to me. So let me frame it this way. I have always had, I think, a relatively clear, I would say, mission or purpose in life. Um, and I know that's kind of a rare thing. I know, I know not, not everyone does. And I, I just, at some point, I think it was in my late teens, I had this very clear idea that what I want to do in life, really what I'm here to do, is to help make people more free. And that's a really broad thing. That can mean a lot of things. And I'm still trying to figure out what that means. But that motivates and drives everything I do. And I've always been really passionate about that. So great, I've got this idea. This is what I want my life to be. I want to make people more free. And that led to two major questions, major questions that all of my intellectual and really career and life pursuits um, have been in an effort to answer. And the first question is, what actually makes for the best and freest world? What does that world look like? What are the policies, institutions, etc.? And the second question is, once you think you know that, what's the best way to get there? It's not enough to just want it and to just do anything. What's the most effective strategy, right? I don't want to just give somebody, you know, a piece of bread. I want to change the conditions that bring about hunger. I don't want to, you know, cure disease. I want to eradicate it. And so deciding what the, the, the freest kind of best society looks like was the first step in the journey. And con concurrent with that is, and how do we get there? And so I start out, you know, I grew up essentially a, a conservative and it, it didn't take long. It didn't, doesn't take much. Um, reading economics and, and some basic political philosophy to become, I think, you know, sort of a, I don't know, mainstream libertarian, if there is such a thing. Um, and the further I took those ideas, it really started with just basic economic ideas. The further I took those, the scarier the place <laughs> that they brought me to at the time, right? It was terrifying. Like, well, if I don't think, you know, uh, whatever, smoking ought to be illegal, then smoking marijuana ought not to be illegal, then maybe prostitution ought not to be illegal. Oh my gosh, this is terrifying, right? I mean, it was a really scary thing to, to kind of follow this thread, follow, um, you know, the, the, the information where it led, both in terms of just economics uh, and ethics. And so, you know, I, I think I think all the essays in this book um, 
they were all written at a time where I was very firmly, I would say, libertarian. Um, but not all of them was I as radical as I am now, or as radical uh, as I as I was by by the essays that appear um, in the front of the book, which are really sort of the latest chronologically. And so as I'm getting dragged more and more into radical anarchism, um, basically realizing that uh, I ran out of excuses for the state. I mean, I tried and tried my damnedest to keep finding excuses for the necessity of the state. I don't know why, like now, you know, it's like once the scales fall from your eyes, you have a heart to, you actually have no sympathy for your past self. I'm like, I don't understand why I thought that, what I was like. You would think I would because it was me, right? I should be able to put myself in my own shoes and remember and sympathize, but I don't. I'm really impatient with myself. I'm like, I was just an idiot. <laughs> um, so I come to these kind of very radical conclusions about the uselessness of the state. But here's the weird thing. That was kind of like the easy part, right? That first question, what makes for the best and freest world? What kind of society is the best? If you really dive in and follow the literature, follow the ideas and the arguments, um, it'll take you to you know a radical place, I think. And, and that's where I ended up. But, but it left unanswered this question of, OK, what's the best way to try to help move the world in that direction? And not only did it leave it unanswered, I think it made me so much angrier. The more radical I became, the less happy I became. And the more, uh, I would say, almost a slave to um, the circumstances around me. You know, you hear on the news about whatever stupid policy is going on. You know, you read some history textbook. You hear a conversation at the grocery store. And nobody's as radical as you are. And the more radical you become, the more isolated you feel, and the more angry you get. And so this weird thing was happening. The more freedom I thought the world needed, the less free I became as an individual. <laughs> and something just wasn't right. And so the title of this book, Better Off Free, it's not just that I think the world or society is better off free. It's that I realized me as an individual, I'm better off when I'm free. And I had to learn how to become free from kind of this preoccupation with how unfree the world was around me. And that was a really challenging thing uh, and something that I, I'm still, you know, dealing with every day. Um, it's, it's hard to maintain optimism and a sense of freedom and self-direction when you're so aware of the many ways in which uh, the state in, encroaches on liberty. So, you know, I'm, I'm going along and my career path, like incredibly tightly models my intellectual journey. So I started out wanting to make the world a better place. I did humanitarian missions, realized pretty quickly, you know, that's, that's very short term. It's about political institutions. I went into politics. Um, through my experience in politics uh, over about three years, as well as the discovery of public choice theory, I realized that there were both uh, practical, based on my experience, and theoretical reasons why politics <clears throat> is absolutely doomed, and it will also destroy any um, shred of humanity or dignity you have uh, in the process of being involved, <laughs> being involved in it. So I fled as quick as I could. I mean, it's it's even it's hard for me to even imagine. There was a time in which I never would have published stuff like this because there was a time in which I was planning on running for office. I was going to be this, you know, libertarian and like change things from the inside. And I even moved my, I, I moved into a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in West Michigan because it was in a certain district that was going to be, I was going to be, uh, you know, an open seat in two years or whatever. I mean, I almost like, it almost blows my mind to even remember that this was me. Um, <clears throat> but that's where I was. And then I went into the world of policy, education, because I came to the belief it's about people's ideas, uh, the politicians are followers. And I write at length about this um, in the book, several sections on the role that beliefs play, um, special interests, uh, public choice theory, quite a bit, because this has really been that second prong of my intellectual journey, discovering what kind of society um, I think is, is the one I wanna live in and, and we wanna live in, and then how to get there. And this how social change happens question has animated me um, from a very young age and continues to. 
So I kind of followed through <clears throat> and um, doing a lot of great stuff that I really loved and, and think was meaningful work in the world of, um, you know, kind of educating uh, people for uh, the ideas of, of liberty at the Institute for Humane Studies, the Mackinac Center. And only very recently, um, and I don't get too much into this in the book, though you'll see in some of the, um, the essays in the beginning that I start to start to talk this way. And those were written um, about a year or two ago, just before I, I launched Praxis and said I was an entrepreneur. Um, but I started to realize that in terms of how the world has changed, no, it's certainly not politics. Uh, it's the beliefs people have. And I was focused for a long time only on one side of that, only on changing people's ideas, giving them new ideas and convincing them intellectually to accept certain ideas as a way of changing their beliefs. But I came to realize that there's a second way to affect beliefs that's more subtle and probably a lot more powerful and pervasive, and that's changing their experiences. You don't have to convince everyone through white papers or logical argument that taxi cartels are inefficient in order for them to change their belief um, and make it politically impossible for taxi cartels to, to continue. You can also innovate and create something like Uber or Lyft and change people's beliefs because you've changed their experiences. And there never even has to be a policy battle or a political debate or a change in ideology. All of a sudden it's like, oh, we still have taxi cartels? I hardly noticed because they're irrelevant now. Kind of innovating around things, um, and that's kind of and that's kind of the space that I'm in now, and it's really exciting. So, again, um, through all this, at each step of the way, I was becoming more radical in where I thought sort of the desired end was. I was becoming less political in terms of how I thought was the best way to get there, and I was learning each step. How do I emancipate myself from this sense that I am like not free because of the knowledge I have, right? Like ignorance is bliss, but the more you learn, the more unhappy you are about the state of the world. You know, you start learning about whether it be business cycle theories or just the, the in, intrusions on civil liberties or, or just how absurd the notion of a state is in general. And you just feel really unhappy and not very free. Um, so learning to deal with that ha has really been a major part of my journey. And I, and I write about that a lot. There's a few essays in there and, um, on this in particular with regards to elections, politics, why I uh, made a conscious choice to stop watching or reading the news. And I haven't watched or read the news in probably eight years. Um, and I don't miss it a bit. Man, that was a great decision. Um, you know, with Facebook and everything, anything that's of interest to me, I'll hear about eventually. Um, and from sources that I probably enjoy more and that make me less angry. So um, <clears throat> so a couple final thoughts, and then we can, we can chit chat if you guys have any questions or any thoughts. Um, one is that if you're not free individually, what's the point? If you don't feel like you are finding a way to live free in an unfree world, to, to paraphrase Harry Brown's great book, um, then I think there's something wrong. If your pursuit of the ideas of liberty make you more angry and make you feel less free, um, you might have to go back to the drawing board and revisit some things. Uh, if you, as my nine-year-old son says, can't control yourselves from raging in the comments on YouTube, uh, in his case, when somebody talks badly about Minecraft, then maybe it's time to turn the comment section off. That, that's another thing that I did, by the way. Um, you know, as I made myself, uh, and this was a, a conscious choice to make myself start to write um, more, and I was kind of embarrassed and afraid to at times, especially as my ideas were radical and as they evolved over time. I didn't want to write something that was you know, going to be different. My beliefs would be different later. Um, but I chose to never read the comments. Now, maybe that's just because I'm a very emotionally and, you know, weak person that I can't handle it. But I felt like I would get in these comment wars and they would only make me angry. There would be no enlightenment. There'd be no sense of awe and wonder about the, the beauty of, of liberty or anything empowering. It was just like muck and getting stuck in it. Um, so I thought, and because it's essentially criticizing and nitpicking. I thought, I don't want to do that. I want to create. I don't want to just like poke holes and then respond to people's criticisms. I want to just create things. I don't want to do things that feel good. I don't want to do things I don't like to do and that don't make me happy. Um, so if you're not individually free, what's the point? 
Another realization is that none of the ideas I've come to hold, no matter how radical, are really scary. Like there was a time where I thought they would be so scary. Well, what if, what if I run out of excuses and I become an anarchist, right? And what will I tell people? It's like, how will I break it to them? Like, this is going to be awful. And actually, the weird thing is, it's not at all. Like, the weird thing is, the less political I become, um, you can be like as radical as you can imagine, if you, especially if you're not very political. So going into a room and someone saying like, oh, what do you think about, ah, I just don't really care about politics. Frankly, I think government is just like utterly useless. I, I'm, I'm actually an anarchist, believe it or not. Uh, people don't know what to say. They think it's weird. They might ask you some questions. But that's actually much more passable than saying, oh, um, I like candidate X instead of candidate Y, right? That's like going to piss people off way more. <laughs> it's really weird. Um, but really, I just sort of learned to be, I was really afraid for a while to like let my radical ideas be known. Like this is the, the age of Google and, you know, this stuff is permanent. You know, what if I go to try to get a job someday at some normal place? What's going to happen? You know what? I don't care. I'm happy to answer. And that was a good filter for me to, to assume everything I post on Facebook, everything I write is going to be public because that forces me to say, I'm not going to sell out or squish in my beliefs, but I can communicate in a way that's not condescending or that's not crazy. Um, and people will respect that. And, and to a large degree they have. So um, with a few exceptions, I will say um, of everything that's, that's in this book, all the different ideas and articles, there's only two topics that universally, I think both of them, the original places that I posted them had like hundreds of comments um, and lots of all caps and all bold. <laughs> That's immigration and intellectual property. Um, even the, no matter where you go, you can't find a crowd of libertarians radical enough where there won't be several, even if it's all libertarians who get really ticked off if you say uh, you think immigration should be open and intellectual property uh, is a bad idea. Um, I got a lot of flack for those, which I was actually surprised by. I was actually surprised by that. But the final insight. Oh, okay. So that, so first insight was, uh, if you're not free individually, what's the point? The second one is don't be afraid to be, um, radical. If, if that's really what you believe, um, you know, take yourself lightly and don't be condescending, but it's okay. Like people will actually, if you're nice and kind and not in their face and argumentative about it and, and sort of apolitical, you can get away with that. Um, and finally, Publishing this book, as I mentioned before, with the reference to the Squirrels article, um, just like publishing each and every one of the individual essays in there, uh, some of them were in you know, the Freeman or uh, some of them were in non-libertarian outlets, uh, newspaper letters to the editor, things like that, is really scary. If you've never published anything, um, do it if for no other reason than that it will scare you. And it makes you really self-conscious and you feel really embarrassed. Um, but that's one of the ways that I had to learn to be free. I had to learn to not become a slave to my past self and to say, it's okay if I publish something and then two years later, I have a different opinion on that. There are plenty of essays in this book where, like especially some of the ones near the end, which are, uh, again, the older ones, um, I'm more radical now. I probably give more deference to the political process than I would now. There are things in there that uh, my views have sort of morphed or become more complex. Um, some things that I would never actually venture to write about now because I've learned, you know, like uh, monetary theory. Like I've learned enough about it to know that I don't know enough about it. <laughs> but there's some sort of beautiful naivete and innocence when you first, uh, you know, read some books on it. You're willing to, to venture out there and write about that. And, you know, I just chose to put it out there because there's something about that that it's freeing to say, who cares? Who cares if people say this is this is childish. Well, so what? I was childish when I wrote it. Like, it's okay, you know? Um, so pushing yourself to, to do things that might be potentially embarrassing and, um, and putting them out there. Because, you know, I look at the list of books on liberty.me and uh, I think those are real authors. Uh, and I think, well, I'm not a real author. You know, I'm just some guy. Um, but you know what? It doesn't matter. Um, and if, you know, if a few people enjoy a few of the essays, great. Um, I enjoyed writing them, so uh, I, I kind of had to force myself to do that. So this is kind of a long and rambling uh, with not a, a very clear point, but the book is my journey asking those two questions, what makes for the best world and how do we get there? Um, 
and uh, and I, I learned several things in the process of, of writing it and going through it. And I hope that you guys enjoy reading it. And uh, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to chat. Oh, wonderful! Oh, uh, I it didn't your talk didn't have like a central theme and a thesis uh, from beginning to end, uh, but it was nonetheless um, a lot of fun and also really struck home for me at least in terms of that sense of as. Uh, especially in the early years of uh, learning uh, libertarian theory, you you learn the ideas about how important freedom is, and you feel less free step by step because you realize all these impositions on your freedom. But you know, maybe partly that's because the emphasis in libertarian writing until recently has been on uh, state encroachments and how to modify them rather than on market alternatives or other free alternatives and how to expand them and how to make us a freer world like like uh which is kind of what you come to in the book so maybe yeah, maybe the uh, transition will be easier oh sorry go ahead no no yeah absolutely i mean i, I think you know and, and and jeff tucker is one of the greatest at, at kind of espousing this um you know embodying this mindset of look i mean this is fun you know, this is this is beautiful. Like the whole freedom project, both learning it, understanding it, trying to spread it, and living it yourself, it's enjoyable. And if it's not, something's wrong. You know, you're you're not going to be as effective if you're unhappy, and you're just not going to be as happy. <laughs> so, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in this section of the program, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Liberty.me live format, we have a regular chat box in the bottom right where people just type all kinds of crazy things and they zip by all at once. And so that's kind of the instant gratification place to type. And we also have a Q&A box uh, up on the top right uh, where you can put a formal question and that makes it kind of certain that Isaac and I will see it and we'll address it in a more formal way. Um, uh, I, uh, Isaac, uh, I wanted to jump in before anybody else gets a chance and, and just ask about another one of the pieces. I was really struck by the, the essay where you compare uh, the writings of Hesiod and Aristotle, like these two ancient uh, figures. And a, a lot of the writing in the piece, a lot of the essays are very fresh, very spontaneous, uh, focused on up-to-date issues, and they, they don't kind of show off a classical learning or a classical training. But then there's this quite erudite piece comparing the visions of Hesiod and Aristotle on individual virtue and hard work. And so I was, it made me wonder about your vision as to where classical learning or big ideas learning fits in terms of the practical challenge of a person trying to make their own life more free? That's a great question. Yeah, um, I am a huge, huge advocate, a huge fan of kind of, you know, the great books, uh, the big ideas, um, a liberal arts education, philosophy. I mean, you know, the, the things that, that I write about here and elsewhere they're all, you know, none of them are, you know, just sort of like descended from on high original ideas. They're all inspired by all the things that I read and everything from, uh, you know, the, the, the ancient Greek philosophers to um, just about every, every era of the history of economic thought from the school of Salamanca to the physiocrats to the, the early Austrians to, you know, the neoclassicals. I mean, there's so much that, I require, I feel like I'm a really inefficient writer. I require about 10 times at least more input uh, for, you know, so for every page of output in writing, I have to read like 10 or 100 pages at least <laughs> of like fresh new ideas from all over the place. Um, so it is very much informed by that. And I think wrestling with the big ideas and the big writers, like you shouldn't be writing about, I mean, I don't want to sound elitist or anything like that, but in general, like, don't dive into writing about spontaneous order unless you've read a whole bunch of Hayek, like several books and, you know, uh, not just Hayek, right? I mean, if you're not, you're not going to write about monetary theory without diving into it or public choice theory. Um, and I, I really have dived into stuff on, on, on kind of a, um, you know, a pretty, pretty in-depth way, but, I don't, I'm not an academic and I don't kind of pretend to be an academic. And so what you see in a lot of the writings, and I also, I have some weird beliefs. Like I hate the practice of citations. Um, I actually kind of see it as, as part of a broader cultural 
trend, which, which is the same culture that produced and, and worships intellectual property. This idea that, you know, of like the lone genius creator. And then like, if you're ever going to reference an idea that anyone else has ever uttered, you have to, you know, cite them rigorously. And it makes for really cumbersome, clunky reading. And I think it sort of, it sort of communicates a false idea about the way that the creative process happens. I don't know if you've ever seen the video series, everything is a remix, but that's kind of more my take is that we're all, you know, building off of other ideas. And, and for the longest time, when you read Adam Smith's, uh, you know, story of the pin factory, his famous description of the division of labor, um, that was like identical to uh, earlier writings by, I can't remember who it was in France. It might, it might have been Turgot. It might have been somebody else. I'm not sure. Um, describing a button factory. Smith was aware of that. His contemporaries were aware of that, but there was no need to cite it or anyone to call him a plagiarist because the way that the intellectual process, it was more of a continual like narrative everyone's engaged in. And those damn Germans, uh, they decided to formalize everything and make this, this citations and everything's got to be so rigorous. Otherwise it's plagiarism. And, you know, um, I think it was like started with the German historical school from my limited knowledge. And I kind of hate that. And so I always choose deliberately. I have a couple rules in my writing. Um, one, I will never mention a politician by name. Uh, that's a newer rule. There may be some essays in the book where I do. I don't think so um, because I don't think they deserve the credit. And I think whatever point I'm making is bigger than the name of a particular politician. Because the minute you mention a politician by name, um, everybody debates whether or not it's true of that politician or they defend or whatever. I want to make a point that's bigger than that. Um, and two, if I can't talk about things kind of just in the, in the realm of their ideas without a ton of citations and references and quotations and things like that, then I probably don't have a good enough grasp of the ideas. Like I want to talk about it in my own language as an, and as I internalize it. And so I'd rather read a, a book in its entirety, let it stew for a couple of days, and then write a bunch of blog posts or whatever that are kind of what I learned from the book. Sometimes I never reference the book at all. And I'm not trying to rip off or plagiarize. I'm just communicating the ideas as they sort of are impressed upon me. And I find that a much more enjoyable way to write. And I like reading that way as well. So um, there's a lot of stuff in the book where, you know, you could almost track it if you looked at my reading list at any given time in my life. Like, okay, I was reading like Hesiod and Aristotle and all this stuff um, at this time period. And that's one of the few articles where I do specifically reference it. Um, and you can kind of see what I'm reading based on what I'm writing, but I don't often reference it uh, for, for that reason. I'm kind of stubborn in that way. That was a very long response. I apologize. <laughs> no, but it was helpful. And I like that rule. Well, at least I like the rule about politicians. I find it hard to get away from citations myself. They make me feel warm and cozy and safe. <laughs> yeah, uh, some people a, like, and if you get more accurate in your writing, you, you should. Yeah. <laughs> if if you intend to get more academic, you're kind of stuck with them. Okay, I've got a question from Tasm Lab, and uh, he uh, asks, uh, "Hi team, there seems to be two kinds of uh, libertarians, and uh, similar to the bifurcation Tucker's laid out between humanist, brutalist, or thick and thin." And he wonders if the 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 relevant gap is uh, between complainy libertarians uh, complaining about the Fed or the TSA. Uh, versus those who'd uh, prefer to move somewhere sunny and start a business. Oh. And take their, their uh, kids out of school and just talk, stop talking about the assholes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a... Um... I think that's a fairly relevant Isaac, did we um, lose you? dichotomy. Now, can you hear me? Still got me? Oh, yeah, we've still just got some legs. Okay. So you go right ahead and keep still yeah, rolling. You... Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's an interesting dichotomy. You know, sort of uh, complainer or or doer, and and I don't. I don't want to be somebody who says no one should ever complain. Actually, there's an essay near the, near the end of uh, one of the sections in praise of discontentment. Um, and I kind of always hated this, like, shut down anybody who's complaining because the world is amazing. You know, I, I referenced that Louis C.K. video, you know, everything's amazing and nobody's happy. You know, everyone's complaining about their airplane. Meanwhile, they're flying over, you know, using Wi-Fi, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
something about that's always rubbed me the wrong way because I'm like, it's that discontentment that drives us to better things. And that's that's pretty awesome. Like, I'm okay with complaining. I think we, we should be unhappy with, you know, like, hey, this boot's on my neck and it sucks. But um, I think when that's productive, when it generates us to seek solutions and seek action, whether just in our own lives, even if it's just like so-called escapism, um, which I also defend uh, in the book, um, or whether it's uh, trying to actually remove the boot um, and, and, and change the world in some way. I like that a lot more um, rather than just, hey, here's what's wrong with everything. Um, okay, well, what can we do about it? Why is it that way? How did it get that way? What can be done to change it? And this is one of those things I really, I don't want to step on any toes here, but I really don't enjoy and I try to stay out of any debates that are like, what should libertarians do or be or like debates about libertarianism qua libertarianism as like a movement not not a set of ideas not classical liberal ideas just like should libertarians be thick or thin should they you know eat pizza or subs should they you know whatever like should they be libertines in their personal life should they be you know i i don't really care what libertarians should or shouldn't be like I care about the ideas of liberty um, and I care about advancing those in a way that's fun for myself. Um, and I think kind of criticizing these nebulous things like a movement or society or, you know, the sheeple or whatever don't really help. It's like discussions where, oh, people are so ignorant of economics. It's so frustrating. Okay. That doesn't get us anywhere to point that out. Maybe you could say, hey, like, let's, let's just be like non, you know, offended and emotional about this. Yeah, people don't know much about economics. Well, being a good economist, economic thinker, we should assume that it must not be in their rational self-interest to know much about economics. Wonder why that is. Wonder if we could do something to change the incentives so that it is, right? See it as a fun, creative challenge, not something to bitch about. You know what I mean? Uh, that was a great, uh, and um, characteristic answer for you where rather than picking uh, rather than even picking a fight about the practice of picking fights uh, you propose to do something fun and practical down down the middle or off to another direction uh, a, it seems to be a, a characteristic of your whole life path uh, so I th thank you so much uh, for this interesting and inspiring talk about your, your own uh, journey and the new book. Oh, um, and I want to make sure that we get a, a question from James Walpole here. And there's, I've also got another one from SMG. Um, so I'm not going to let you escape. Yet. James Walpole asks, uh, what writers have been most influential on your own style? Ooh, that's a great question. Um... You know, I think in terms of style, I, I, I've I've never really been that disciplined about writing, so I'm not like Preston Thompson who sits down and you know rewrites uh, Hemingway's books so that I can gain his style. Um, I probably you know should be and, and and wish I was a little more disciplined and conscious in trying to emulate somebody's style. But I think I think the people you read a lot influence your style. Um, and that can be really dangerous for libertarians because, <laughs> because if you read a lot of Hayek, for example, um, it'll, you'll write stuff that's really hard to read. Uh, I actually happen to think Mises is a really clear and concise writer. A lot of people complain about his writing. I actually really like it. Um, but I would say the, there's only really one writer that I think really has influenced my style, uh, and that's C.S. Lewis. And I think that's primarily because I began – reading him when I first kind of decided I liked ideas. I mean, like I literally did nothing but play Legos and baseball until I was like 15 or 16. And I, I don't even know if I knew how to read. And then I, you know, I started reading, I got interested in ideas. And Lewis was the first thing I read. I read tons of Lewis books and his style. What I love about it is he's, he's logically rigorous. He's a, he's a good philosopher. He lays out premise and conclusion. He has a sound structure and you may not agree with him, but you're not going to find all kinds of like fallacy and straw man and, and all kinds of problems with the structure. But he does it in such a way where he's so 
colloquial and warm and he'll like throw in references to like yummy sounding food and all <laughs> you know it's just there's something that like you enjoy reading it it's, it's witty um but it has a good flow but it but it's also if you poke the surface it's not just like oh this is so romantic and warm like there's a tight logic to it and i really respect that so that's probably one that i, I would say has influenced me a lot i, I don't think i write uh, nearly as well as him but um but otherwise um I, I do really like the style of writing and uh, you don't see it much in me, but I keep trying to get closer to it. Um, that's very punctuated and short. I mean, almost to the extreme of, of like a Hemingway. I really, I really like trying to economize on words um, as much as possible. And I've tried to train myself to not say things like, I think I believe it's my opinion, but to just say like, this is the way it is. Um, it's more interesting and it maybe sounds like I'm being arrogant, but like, that's my opinion. Uh, so of course I'm going to say that's how it is. That's what you're left to agree or disagree with. Um, so anyway, I don't know. I don't know what else, uh, what else to offer there, but, but I would just say that tons and tons of reading of tons of different kinds of readers or writers. Um, you know, the more I read, the more I feel like I know how to write. Um, and, and that's a huge, a huge thing that I, I found if I ever stop reading, um, my writing starts to, to suck. Oh, uh, wonderful. Yes, I've um, really enjoyed oh, yacht, both C.S. Lewis. Can't forget. Can't forget oh. Lost the Yacht. Because he's <laughs> so freaking witty. Even though he was not writing in English, I mean, he's just, he's brilliant. I love his way of, of explaining economic ideas. That was hugely influential to me. Yeah. Yeah, Bastiat is great. I'm shocked to hear that anyone uses his writing. It's the most beautiful, crisp, clear form of writing known to man. Uh, <laughs> so I've got one um, kind of hearkening back um, uh, to what you were talking about a moment ago with respect to divisions inside uh, libertarianism. This one's from SMG53. He asks, um, at what point is someone calling themselves a libertarian not really a libertarian? And then, like, if, um, if we are to avoid these uh, internal divisions, he, he says, I have my own opinion, but I'm curious about how you would answer that. Um, I guess I just don't care. Uh, look, there's <laughs> actually, this is not an essay that is in this book, um, but, but I wrote an essay not long ago, maybe a couple years ago. Um, called Don't Let Words Own You. And I think the idea that we can sort of own and maintain the purity of the word libertarianism, I think it's kind of counterproductive. Um, like, who cares? It used to be called liberalism, what we believed in. Um, and then that kind of got morphed over time. And then it was classical liberalism, and then libertarianism. Now there's all the, you know, you can be an anarchist, a volunteerist, an anarcho-capitalist. I don't really care. I don't care what the label is. I'll use whatever one seems to be the most appropriate at the time. You know, if I'm with a group of people that are, they ask, what are my political beliefs? And I can tell they really don't want to know. I'll just say like, yeah, I favor limited government. Um, you know, limited to the point where it's not existent But that's really what they're at. They, they don't really want to know right if someone wants to know on a deeply philosophical standpoint i'll say i favor anything peaceful well, what's the label for that i don't know libertarianism anarchism I, I don't really care um i guess i'm just not that interested in that and i find that it kind of has this weird conservative view of language like it's something you can freeze in time and it ought to be defended against all comers you know the way the french are like no we can't allow this word to ruin our pure language you know we've got to fight off <laughs> languages evolve and the point of words is to is to communicate albeit imperfectly uh, ideas as metaphors and symbols and use the one that seems the best to describe you um or don't use one at all i don't really care uh, and, and i guess going around saying well that person can't be a libertarian X, Y, and Z, it's not that fruitful to say, well, you know, if someone says, oh, libertarians believe in, I don't know, whatever, you know, um, welfare, right? And you could say, well, I guess I don't really know what you mean by libertarians, but I know a lot of people that use that name for themselves and they don't believe in welfare or 
I certainly don't, right? Like make it about the ideas. I, I just, I just am, am very uninterested in debates over um, where the line is drawn, who counts and who doesn't. Like, it's a word, you know? <laughs> Great. Um, and then I, I've got a, uh, I've got two more questions from the lab. One is uh, kind of following on the same line, so I'll do it first. Um, uh, and maybe the same way. He says, uh, can there be something like a peaceful progressive, like a, a leftist that's against the violence of the state and still hold progressive or leftist goals? Um, I mean, I think I've, I think I've met or read people like this, um, if I know what you're talking about. If by progressive goals, it's sort of, you know, um, more greater income equality, um, you know, more people using more, um, you know, crappy recyclable products or whatever it might be. No, I shouldn't say crappy, but they mostly are. Um, yeah, I mean, look, look. This is what libertarian or or a freedom minded philosophy. It's about the means. It's about using force as a means, and that that's both economically inefficient and immoral. Um, and you can have all kinds of crazy goals or ends, but if you say I'm committed to nonviolence as a means, um, there's nothing about that that is non libertarian. Uh, I don't buy this whole like thick idea that, you know, libertarian ideas demand that you also have a set of ideas, broader sort of social and ethical ideas. I don't happen to think libertarianism is a life philosophy. I think it's a political philosophy. I think you can have a lot of different life philosophies and I think it will probably inform those. Um, but I, I think it's, it's entirely possible to say you know, I only want to use peaceful means to, you know, you know, create a world where everyone does uh, what I want them to do. You know, I'm not going to succeed because, <laughs> because if I can't use violence, <laughs> no one's going to want to do that. But, um, you know, if I'm actually true to that, um, I'm not really violating any any sort of libertarian uh, standards in, in that sense. So, yeah, I think it's possible. Great, great. And um, uh, last question, Tasm Lev asks, so what did you do for your 30th birthday? <laughs> yeah, this is, that's a great question. So I did turn 31 uh, last week and um, we, uh, we went, my, my wife and I and uh, my brother and his wife, we went and played a rousing 18 holes of putt-putt golf um, with a whole bunch of $1 bills to make all kinds of bets on various, you know, closest to the hole and all this stuff. Uh, smoked a good cigar and had some pho from a uh, Vietnamese restaurant here. So that's about the perfect birthday for me. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Oh, well, thank you uh, for sharing what is new perfect evening for us on Liberty.me Live. Isaac, it's been fun, it's been informative, um, it's uh, been practical. And uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell people a little bit about a few more great Liberty.me Live coming up later in the week. Then I'm going to give people a few links to more resources uh, for, us, uh, for the for Isaac's company, Praxis, and then I'll turn it back, back to you. You, Isaac, and give you the last word. Of uh, the things I want to tell you about happening at Liberty.me Live this week, I have three things to tell you about. Is we have the beginning of our series with Rachel Mills, uh, formerly of Liberty with uh, Rachel. And this is a Saturday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, or the, the class is running at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on this Saturday. And uh, is uh, talking with Angela Keaton, who's the director of operations at anywar.com and the whole talk is going to be about ISIS stuff. Uh, where did ISIS come from? Is the United States responsible for it? Are we going to be stuck fighting another shadowy made-up enemy for another 30 years? Uh, so that's that's what's on Saturday. And here's the link to that class. Uh, then uh, back to something that's uh, kind of focused on uh, Isaac's uh, approach. 
Do we uh, have a class on this Sunday at 3 in the afternoon Eastern Time with Jake DeSillis? DeSillis is a successful British who sold his business in his early 30s, I think, and he now lives in Central America podcasting on me and uh, his guide on uh, is called negotiate for mutual profit yeah, this liberty guide it's one of my favorites using the art of negotiation to find you to find things uh where you can give the other person and they can give you and both you can become better off so here's the link to that class. looking forward to it and then uh on uh, a sunday evening at eight in the evening, we have uh, yet another of the Jeffrey Tuck Classic series. And this one is about a book of comics of Albert Hahn. So this is coming in to talk about a 1949 book, uh, effective as a, a key a, a attack on Keynesianism because the author is Keynesian himself. So the three things I want to tell you about, great stuff coming up at me live later. And now I want to give you four links to resources on more Isaac Morehouse stuff. Now, first, here's the book itself. The book Isaac's been talking about that collects these great essays. I encourage you to go in, go to section three, read the squirrel essay first. <laughs> right, there's the link. Then uh, another thing I should mention is that uh, hmm, that link didn't come through. Let's try that one again. Oh, there it is. Good. Uh, then <laughs> we've got uh, something Isaac didn't mention is we actually have a wonderful Liberty Guide by Isaac uh, called Wonderful Liberty Guide by Isaac uh, called uh, Rethinking Higher and Higher Education. And it partly, it gives in a sense the framework uh, within which Isaac's company, his education company Praxis comes into play. The sense of trying to regain control of your education so that it actually serves your, your life goals, your economic goals, uh, rather than just giving you a piece of paper approved by the state and not providing any economic value to you. So it's a really enjoyable guide, and the link is there in the chat. And uh, here is the main Isaac Morehouse, the central hub of all things Isaac Morehouse on the web, isaacmorehouse.com, surprisingly enough. And then finally, uh, I also want to mention Isaac's company, Praxis, where he puts his ideas into practice, and the, the, the website right, for that well, thanks, is right Mike, there. And thanks, guys, oh. for coming out. I really... Uh, <clears throat> Really don't have any great uh, sage sage wisdom to leave you with, but I will say this: um, find one thing every day that you can do to make yourself feel a little more free. Maybe it's just reading something. Maybe it's writing something. You know, um, something you can opt out of. Something you can laugh at. Something you can ignore. A news show you can turn off. Um, whatever it is, find something that makes you feel a little more free every day. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoy the book. I certainly enjoyed the evening.